In this video, we're going to take a look at some miscellaneous features and techniques in Fiddler Everywhere. It's pretty common when we use Fiddler Everywhere and look at traces between the browser and the server that we might notice some random files that we're not sure why they're there. We're often using third-party libraries and frameworks that might pull in additional files that we're not familiar with, and Fiddler Everywhere has a nice way to trace from a particular file back to why it was requested. So we'll take a look at Fiddler Everywhere for this request. And what we'll notice is there's a request at the bottom here for a font file. And I'm not sure exactly why that was being included in the page. What I can do is just right click and say select parent request. This will look back in the web sessions and identify why this was used. So now I can see that font file was included because it was part of Bootstrap that I'm using for the design of the page. I'll often use Fiddler and get a trace between a browser and a server that I want to then share with someone else, another developer or an operations or a third party vendor. And there's times I want to put some additional information into that trace. So I'm going to see here the jQuery request and I'm gonna add a comment to it saying that I'd like to see this get upgraded. So I can simply right click and say comment and hit OK. And by default, that column might, might not appear in Fiddler. You can see an indicator that there's a comment here. I can just customize my columns and add the comments. And then as I scroll to the right, we can see those specific comments. So it's nice that it shows an indicator here that there is a specific comment on that specific session and then I can go see the details. So it's a nice way to communicate within the actual trace with other people. So when I start Fiddler Everywhere, it's notifying, in my case, Windows, to tell it if anyone proxies HTTP or HTTPS traffic, please go to the port that Fiddler Everywhere is running on. This is helpful because I can see all of the things happening between my client and various hosts. Unfortunately, it's distracting and can be pretty frightening how much your machine is communicating with other hosts on the internet. Traditionally, I've used the capturing facility where I can just capture the trace that I want and then toggle this off so no other traffic is here. Once I've identified what I wanted to see, I can just stop traffic from coming in. Unfortunately, there could be traffic from other services that I don't want to see that get mixed in with these requests. So I like to use the filter feature. And if we look here and open the filters, I typically will set up a filter based on the host name. So in this case, I wanted to start with Robert-FE for Fiddler Everywhere. Those are the various hosts I want to see when I do this capture. That way I don't have other requests from background services mixed in, which makes it harder to find what I'm looking for. So it's very common to come here. There's lots of filters that I can use. This is a very useful one, so you can hone in on just the specific hosts that you want to see during this trace. And we can see by looking at the web sessions that they all indeed do start with that host and we don't have other requests in here that are making it difficult for us to understand specifically what we want to see. Another useful way to filter, if I need to use multiple browser instances potentially and I only want to trace from a specific instance, I can look at the process that's running now. So I've got Edge open looking at the page I can go back to customize my columns. And in this case, I'm going to add the process ID. So now I can see the process ID of the instance I currently have open. So if I go back to filters, I'm going to add a condition based on the process. And for ease, I'm just going to say contains. 7176. I could type this specific process with the colon and such. I'm going to choose to do this for now. So I can see those are still here. If I go open another instance of a browser, we can see when we open up Firefox and go to the same host and then go back to Fiddler Everywhere that it hasn't changed because this was filtering specifically only for using Edge and that specific process ID. So again, this is a nice way to isolate 
from background services or other browser instances where I may still be going to the same host that I only see traffic for this specific process. In Fiddler Classic, there was a way to emulate different browsers. So I could spoof the user agent sent from the client to the server. So the server, if it looks at specific user agents and customizes its content, I may want to simulate that from the client and see how the server responds. Obviously, the client is still going to be, in my case, the Edge browser, but I can communicate to the server that I'm actually a different user agent. I'm going to do that today in Fiddler Everywhere using a rule. So you can see I have a spoof user agent rule. I'll just open that. And we can see I'm looking if the protocol is either HTTPS or HTTP. I want to update the request header called user agent and set it to this specific string. And if we go to the end, you can see Firefox in the specific version. So in this case, when I enable this rule, the server will actually think that I'm a different client. So I'll save this. So I went to a site that reflects what user agent the server is seeing, and you can see that it sees Edge as my client. If I go back to Fiddler Everywhere, I'll just enable this rule and go request that page again. And now you can see from that server's perspective, I look like I'm running Firefox. So again, this is helpful if I need to impersonate a different user agent to my server. That way, if the server behaves differently based on what user agent string it sees, I'll see that different content come back in Fiddler. The next thing we'll look at is the ability to indicate responses that set cookies. So if you needed to be compliant with GDPR or other specific regulations where you needed to know all of the responses of a particular site that set cookies, that was available in Fiddler Classic in the Filters tab as a checkbox. We can do the same thing here using a rule. So we'll take a look at what the rule looks like. And we can see we're just looking for a response header that has a set cookie that's not empty. And then we highlight the background of it in yellow. I created a very simple .NET 6 example using Razor Pages where I set a cookie on this specific page. The first time we use the page, we'll have the rule turned off. So I'm just going to hit Control F5 to do a refresh. And we go back to Fiddler Everywhere. We can see the requests that were made. Now if I turn on this rule, and we go make the requests again, when we go back to Fiddler Everywhere, we'll now see that that specific request is setting a cookie. So if we looked at inspectors and looked at the raw response, we can see the cookie was indeed set. So this is a very handy rule. If you need to know which responses specifically set cookies, this is a very easy rule to identify those specific sessions. Another useful feature from Fiddler Classic in the Filters tab was the ability to do what was called a time heat map. So there were rules in Fiddler Classic specifically around how long a response would take, and it would indicate using either green, yellow, or red based on various thresholds how long a particular response took. It was nice because you could turn it on and immediately identify those responses that were taking longer than those thresholds so you could look into why those were having issues. I've intentionally made Bootstrap extremely slow, like 10 seconds, and I've made jQuery relatively slow using rules that we saw in past videos. Now we'll look at some of these heat map rules. So I just made the thresholds the same as Fiddler Classic. So if I look at the first one, if it's less than 50 milliseconds, it will have a background of lime. So that's a very fast response. If we look at the next threshold, between 300 and 500 milliseconds gets a yellow for its relatively slow response. And then lastly, anything above 500 milliseconds is used with red for the background for that response to indicate it's something we really should focus on. If we go back and make a request for the page and then go back to Fiddler Everywhere, we can see that it indicates specific responses and how fast they were. I added the duration as a custom column. So if I went to the right, I can see the actual milliseconds it took and you can indeed say 
that based on these ranges, we can see the various indicators in the background about the performance for those pages. Another nice feature is the ability to import traces that were captured by browser dev tools. So I'm here in Edge, I'm going to hit F12 and go to dev tools. I'm going to be on the network tab, I'm going to hit control F5. And I can see the requests that are being made. I can simply right click and say save all as har with content. We'll save off this specific set of requests and responses. Now I have the ability to import that into Fiddler Everywhere. Because I'm more comfortable and familiar with using that tool to do troubleshooting. So let's see how we do that in Fiddler Everywhere. Back in Fiddler Everywhere I can go to the sessions and say that I want to import. So if we go to the downloads and I open that HAR file, now we can see the requests in Fiddler again. So it's just a nice ability, especially on someone else's machine where I may not want to install software. I can just open their browser dev tools, use the network, save off that content, and then import it. Now I can do my analysis in Fiddler everywhere where I'm used to the features and the things that I want to look for. The last feature we'll look at in this video is called host mapping in Fiddler Classic. But the idea was you have a specific host, in this case I'm on example.com, but I want it to look like it's on example.com from the client's perspective, but I actually want to point it to a different website in the back end. So let's take a look at the rule to accomplish that in Fiddler Everywhere. So in this rule, we'll see uh, we're looking for the starting with HTTPS www.example.com. We're going to then update the URL on the fly, and we're going to point it at the page we've been looking at throughout this video. So let's take a look at what happens when we enable this. Now when I'm back in the browser and hit Control F5, it actually looks like the page we've been looking at because it's actually running on that site, but the browser thinks it's still on example.com. For a long time I knew this feature existed in Classic but didn't have a good use for it until one day our production website was using some third-party content that cared it was on our production version of the site, and yet I wanted to debug on my local machine. So I needed a way to make my local machine and the browser think it was actually running on the production site where I actually mapped it to a local site on my laptop so I could do troubleshooting. So I put the production name and mapped it to my development server. Now I could use my Visual Studio and do all of the debugging on my machine and the third-party script would run because the browser thought it was running on my production site. So just a very handy feature at times to make it look like you're running somewhere else to the browser, but actually executing it in another location. That concludes this video series on Fiddler Everywhere. I hope you've learned some new techniques that you can use in your daily web development, and I thank you for watching.